Buju Nindawe Namaganug, my relatives and colleagues. This is Ty Defoe, and I'm here in my apartment in Lenape Kohing in New York City. And I'm sitting with uh, flowers next to me. I'm safe during this pandemic, wearing my favorite t-shirt, a wampum necklace, and some socks today. I have long dark hair tied up in a bun with a yellow elastic band. Despite a heavy heart today, I'm smiling from ear to ear with tears of joy because I get to present this award today to my dear friend and colleague and mentor and teacher and elder and leader in the field of theater and the arts at large. A person who defies all boundaries and binaries that American theater has placed on theater makers. It is hard to know when I first met Daniel because I've been in various um, sometimes surprising and spontaneous spaces with him making connections, making theater, or we could have been um, ancestors past from another life time ago. And I'm sure Daniel gets that from a lot of people because when you meet him, one can instantaneously feel this light beam from Daniel, from his soul. This is my experience of Daniel from making work in a Hogan in the middle of Santa Fe, New Mexico, or facilitating on decolonizing at universities, or making work with him with intergenerational queer folks in Texas after the tragic Orlando shootings. But one of my favorite moments with Daniel was when we were eating celery. Yes, celery. Standing outside of a small theater on the Lower East Side in New York City, waiting to see a show, tired from a long day of being in a hot, hot city in the middle of July. And I wasn't sure what the name. of the piece we don't know one another until we know one another's story and i wasn't sure if this was a rally to go to the show that started at 11 or if this was a larger life lesson and obviously it was a larger life lesson because i believe daniel meant that theater is everywhere the narrative in the streets in the mountains in the water and in each other this is daniel these are only some of the generous gifts that I have time to name and so much more that you can encounter when you spend time with Daniel. When I was asked to present it to Daniel today, I could not think of anyone right now who is more deserving to be recognized for this award, given the atrocities around the globe and especially here in Turtle Island. Dr. Daniel Banks is someone who brings radical hope to the world with him and to every room he works in, whether it's bringing friends together, um, ensemble members, or those who have just entered the conversation about theater making, healing, or liberation. This is how he does it, all the way from grassroots institutions to larger theaters. And if you ever get the blessing to be in circle with Daniel, I guarantee you will feel that you have been brought here. Here for tell you about Daniel and all of his directorial. accomplishments or checked boxes and binaries and processes. He does it all and all at the same time and takes care of artists. And people around him. This type of he all along continually to grow and learn. And he's the most humble person you'll ever meet. He's not just at the top alone, but brings everyone with him because of his moral compass. Daniel is co-founder with his husband, Adam McKinney, of DNA Works, an arts and service organization committed to dialogue and healing through the arts, based in Fort Worth, Texas, and currently working on 
Secret Share, which brings together intergenerational majority Q. BIPOC meant to explore intimacy for Daniel. This life work started 38 plus years ago when he was in high school, when he read the book. It was the thing that gave him hope at that time when he carried this book with him. It was the way Daniel is continually to honor his ancestors and whose lives were taken away too soon. Daniel is my hope for the future. An example of who we theaters, art institutions, and leaders need to be looking towards to experience what he does and how he does it. He defies borders and labels with his concise, steadfast presence and magic in any room, barn, theater. If you get a moment to speak with Daniel, consider yourself blessed in the presence of a true visionary in the field of theater. The Alan Schneider's Award is presented and designed to identify and assist exceptionally talented mid-career freelance directors whose achievements have been demonstrated through work in specific U.S. regions or territories, but who may not be known more widely or recognized nationally. But Daniel defies this definition, defies the borders of this award and the walls of a Boxton theater, all while working from within them for the majority of his career. It is with humbleness, gratitude, and honor, I introduce you all to the winner. <laughs> <gasps> oh my gosh. Uh, I just need him. I just need him. I just need a moment. <laughs> um, that I don't think anyone's ever spoken about me that way before. Thank you so much. Hugs. Hugs. To you as well. To you as well. This is Daniel Banks speaking from Fort Worth, Texas, the land of the Kickapoo, Wichita, and Comanche. I'm in my co-working space, surrounded by books. I have a shaved head, a salt and pepper goatee, and uh, the fluorescent lightings above shining on my forehead. I am humbled and deeply moved to receive the Alan Schneider Director Award. Thank you also, Ty, to you and Kate Freer for nominating me. I am here today because of the support of so many people. Emily Mann, the most generous of mentors, and Kathleen Culebro, Artistic Director of Amphibian Stage Productions here in Fort Worth, both of whom wrote letters of recommendation. Also the award panelists, the DNA Works Ensemble, and my other teachers and mentors, Monica Pagneux, Kwame Kwearma, Rosemary Harris, Una Chowdhury, Roberta Levitao, Ngugi Wathiongo, and Marvin Sims. To the other finalists, it is an honor to be in your company. My profound appreciation goes to theater communication groups, which has been one of the most significant relationships in my professional theater life. I remember reading about Tadashi Suzuki in American theater in 1986 and feeling a sense of relief and excitement because the magazine showed me that the theater community I craved was really out there. Thank you especially to Amelia Cacciaparo and Teresa Eyring for your years of patience, guidance, and kindness and creative partner, Adam McKinney, my sister, parents, and grand and great parents. My mother grew up in the Washington Allen Schneider's productions. In these and many other ways, being here today is coming full circle. and the world is responding in protest. It is quite possible that by the time you hear these words, their meaning will have completely changed. But this exercise feels strangely familiar, speaking into the future, because it is almost everything we do as theater people. So how do we speak into our current future and finally change it? It. 
I to create well-tell stories about people and families that do not neatly fit into boxes. Stories that for ground complex complicated identities, ability, gender, create our own worlds, give shape and contour to our own roles and identities. I hold community story circles as part of performances to balance artist and audience voices and create spaces for community members to learn more about one another. A project that grew organizing a coalition of community organizations to prevent the demolition of the former Ku Klux Klan meeting hall built here in Fort Worth in 1924. We are working to transform it into an international center and museum for art and community healing. This will provide a peaceful gathering place for a divided city, transforming a monument to hate and violence into a symbol of healing and restorative justice. The project's leadership comes from the groups that were terrorized by the KKK here in the 1920s, and the project returns resources to their communities. So on this day, during these times when everyone's life in the theater has shifted radically and the future is uncertain for so many people, I am considering the intersection of our theater work moving forward and our ability to create lasting change in society. I often hear in community story circles that people avoid the topic of racism because it feels too big, as if nothing can be done. What we as a field need is a concrete model for change, an implementable action plan. Imagine what would be possible if together, every US theater institution of every size and affiliation committed to anti-racism on and off their stages. It is not so far-fetched. Many organizations and artists are already doing anti-racism work and with some in the past week, releasing powerful statements and sharing resources. And look at the broad impact that Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS has had, challenging stigmas, generating public support for people with HIV and AIDS, and raising over $300 million in the past 31 years with the participation of theaters from across the country. Let us use this time while waiting for our doors and stages to reopen to engage every artist, staff, board, and audience member in anti-racism work by providing information, trainings, community dialogues, policy advocacy opportunities, and other programming. This commitment to end racism and racial violence, we're at the top of the agenda for all US theaters for the next five years, Think of what we could more would they reach? How many lives could be saved? Theater has done this throughout history, impacting human rights movements and legislation in the US and abroad. This is doable. Politicians across the country are making pledges to root out racism. The mayor of Fort Worth recently revealed, striking a new tone, that she is also, quote, committed to continuing the work potential and then the, I urge us as a field to commit to and spring knowledge to eliminate race to US values and more Thank you for this opportunity to follow in his. Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's plenary. I just want to come on live 
um, to first of all congratulate Daniel Banks for winning the Schneider Award and for Ty's lovely remarks. I apologize for our technical difficulties. Um, that whole video will be available. Um, and please, please, please congratulate Daniel in the comments. Um, his words were beautiful, wonderful, and I hope they will continue to be received by you. Um, I'm gonna move us forward and invite Adrian to come on and give you all some remarks before we move into the space. Adrian? And we can't hear you. We still can't hear you. Do you want to try to unplug your headphones? Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? we can. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Adrian. I'm TCG's Deputy Director and COO, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. Daniel, congratulations. Thank you so much for all your hard work and that call for action. Before we get started, I want to honor the powerful remarks shared yesterday by Jamil Jude, Monique Holt, and Nicole Salter. What you share needs to be watched and rewatched and watched again. Sam, please drop the link in the chat. And to all the folks on the Zoom call, please watch. As TCG's Executive Direct Director, Teresa Iring, shared yesterday, TCG has reframed all of our programming through two criteria. One, does this session center Black, Indigenous, people of color? And two, does it actively work to dismantle white supremacy? If it doesn't, we're not doing it right now. We want to thank all the session leaders, artists, sponsors, and funders who have worked with us to collectively hold ourselves accountable, accountable to this reframe. You have shown nimbleness in shifting your sessions to meet these criteria, and you have shown grace in canceling your sessions or postponing them to a later date. We know this hasn't been easy, but our BIPOC colleagues deserves no less from us, and we know much, much more is needed. This month is also Pride, and as we center our BIPOC colleagues, it's critical to remember the roots of Pride are in a rebellion led in large part by trans women of color. It was the Stonewall uprising that catalyzed our ongoing fight for LGBTQ rights. And so we must name our ancestors, Sylvia, Rivera, and Marsha P. Johnson, who reminded us that we can't have Pride if we don't have liberation for all of us. And we must act immediate, in immediate solidarity with the trans women of color today, especially black trans women who are facing an epidemic of violence. Now I'd like to speak directly to other gay cis men in this space. We cannot sit idly while our trans black, while our black trans brothers and sisters are murdered and killed. The privileges we have right now are, we have it because of their sacrifices and we must do better. In that spirit, I want to name Ayana Dior, a black trans woman who survived a brutal attack a few days ago and who needs her support. In the chat, Sam will drop a link to show how we can send immediate support to Ayana for her safety and recovery. This is what action looks like. And we're gonna take the time right now for you to click on that link and act and to crowdsource the names of other BIPOC trans folks who may need our support and to share links to frontline organizations led by and working with trans communities of color. Please put those links now and let's take collective action together right now. I know that many of the white folks who joined the anti-racism session two days ago engage in a collective act of resource reallocation. We are asking you to do this again. If you don't have the resources to give at this time, please share some of the links you're seeing in the chat on social media. If you're not on social media, please email some of these links to your friends who may have resources. We often hear, how can we help? How can we help? And this is the one of the many ways we can do that. Send resources right now 
the BIPOC and trans folks on the front lines. It's the least we can do. And while we're acting to meet the immediate needs of our BIPOC colleagues during this convening, we want to be clear this work is not going to end when the conference does. This pandemic, this uprising, this convening, there are portals and we are not going back to the way things were before. And although, like many of our theaters, TCG is facing some difficult financial days ahead, we're also making radical shifts in our mission and programming to work toward a truly just and thriving theater ecology. And now it's my great joy to welcome our panelists, playwright Alicia Harris and director Whitney White to the stage. I know it's a screen, but for, day, for, but for today, we'll call it a stage. I'm going to keep their introductions brief to maximize our time with them and say that Alicia Harris's play include Is God Is and What to Send Up When It Goes Down, a play pageant ritual response to anti-blackness, which was produced by the Movement Theater Company and directed by Whitney White. Whitney is also an actor and a musician and the recipient of the Susan Stroman Directing Award. And the last thing I'll say is that I truly don't remember a play that has meant so much to so many people as what to send up when it goes down. We're honored and grateful by your presence today, Alicia and Whitney. Thank you. We are pleased and honored to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Hi, Thank Whitney. Hi, Alicia. Thank you, Adrian. Those words were beautiful. And just thank you for taking the space that you just took um, to make space for Black trans lives. It's beautiful. Yeah, we appreciate it. So Whitney. Hey, girl. <laughs> I am so excited for the opportunity to sit down with Whitney because we are frequent collaborators. We've worked on What to Send Up. And we're working on a few other wonderful things. And, um, but there's so much that we don't know about each other. Yeah. So this opportunity to sit down and sincerely and honestly get to know a bit about each other's journeys and process is really thrilling, I think, to both of us, right? Yeah. 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 So why don't we start um, with a check-in? Where are you? What are you doing? How are you moving through these moments, Whitney White? Um. Thank you for that question. Alicia Harris, gosh, you guys, this woman is the truth. She's everything. Um, I am in Chicago. I am near my loved ones and family, which I'm so grateful for. Um, and it's, I normally live in New York and it's been a really interesting time to be in the Midwest. Um, there's so much about both areas that I think I take for granted and in this time so much is coming to light for all of us and it's it's very interesting to be in Chicago um, with my family during this time but I'm grateful for it. Uh, in terms of how I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling concerned, I'm feeling tired, but I'm feeling hopeful. I'm thankful we get to share space together today um, and talk a little bit more and learn more about each other. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, uh, I agree. So, so grateful for this treasured space. I am in the North Valley um, in Los Angeles area. Um, I don't have family around, um, but I do have friends in the city. I'm, I'm feeling nurtured and supported from afar. It's, what's interesting about this COVID time is that there are folks I have contact with that I ha wouldn't normally because there's something about this new like uh, virtual world that we're accessing. That's really neat. And um, I'm moving through things um, with great intensity. There's a lot of adrenaline running through my body <laughs> that I need to work out and um, with anger, um, and which I allow myself fully and with hope. Um, yeah, and, and I'm moving through it thinking a lot about the work as, as, as a bomb. Yeah. And also as a fuel, as, as, you know, as much as the stressful things are keeping me up at night, I'm really grateful to get to channel them through the work as I always have. And I understand you have. Yeah. So I think we might segue into um, the work and yeah. talking a bit about um, what our journeys have been, because we both are sort of multifaceted artists who've explored other forms and found our way to the theater. So why don't we talk about that? That's dope. I mean, I think that's really important to, to hear each other's histories. Alicia and I were trying to figure out what to talk about and what we wanted to ask each other. And, and she was like, we don't know some, that much about uh, our backgrounds because mm -hmm. 
while we have a lot of overlap and obviously a lot of areas in which we have community and we commune together um, and, and just things we agree about, the paths that we took to get to where we are really different. And for black artists out there watching this, mm -hmm. it's important to hear it because I remember finally meeting mm -hmm. black artists I, I wanted to be in dialogue with and hearing their backgrounds was incredibly liberating for me. Um, so, you know, my gateway drug to the theater was singing. I was always singing in the choir, honey, singing in the church. And I went to this white Catholic school on the north side and I wasn't Catholic. I was like one of two black students in the school. It was incredibly challenging. But my Catholic liturgical teacher heard me singing The Lion King one day and she was like, she kind of lost her mind and she like petitioned the school for me to be able to sing in the church and everybody was mad because I was like this little black kid who wasn't Catholic. And shout out to my liturgical music teacher because she really held it down. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my entryway in all this and music still is such a big part of my work. Um, and you know, I thought I was gonna be a singer uh, but I couldn't give up like wine and chocolate. So that didn't really work out. And then I got cast in my first play. And um, another moment that kind of race was, was really a part of that, I was cast in Oklahoma and I wanted to be the lead, but I was told that Lori couldn't be black. And so I was Lori's friend. And I, I remember that super vividly, that moment. Um, and then I went to Northwestern and kept kind of dabbling in theater, but again, got, I have a lot of love for the program, but I also, there was a lot of complicated things in that program in terms of the roles available to black actors and the resources available to black actors. And so I tried a political science degree and I was like, you know what, maybe theater's not for me. I should try and be a diplomat. I love people and I love talking and I should try and do a more, live a more politically based life. But mm -hmm. I kept coming back to the theater. And when I hit a wall with acting, uh, I luckily met an incredible mentor at Brown Trinity's MFA program, um, Brian Murtis and his wife, Melissa Kievman. And they really were the first ones who were like, you really need to try and direct. And at the time, I had no idea that I could direct for some mm -hmm. reason. I never, I always wanted to be in control of my narrative stories, but I had spent my life as a musical theater actor, um, shucking and jiving as it were on stages, because when you can dance and sing and you're a person of color, people encourage you to do that. They don't mm -hmm. necessarily encourage you to get in control of your own story mm -hmm. and put that mm -hmm. up there. And these mm -hmm. two people did. And um, also Tyler Dabrowski is another colleague of mine who was instrumental in that transition. And when I directed my first play, it was like everything came together um, for me. And so it was a circular route. And acting in theater, I feel like it quit on me many times when people mm -hmm. told me, well, you know, you can play the best friend or the token role or the sassy role or the sexy wife or just the tropes, the, the sister, mother, or whore, you know, the tropes that black women are so often asked to play and still asked to play on stage and on camera. It just, I hit a wall mm -hmm. and luckily found directing. That's beautiful. I'm glad that you found directing. And there are definitely parallels in our stories. So I am a lifelong storyteller nerd in the room by herself with her dolls, taking yeah. it a little too seriously, telling stories that were a little too grown for my little self. <laughs> Um, and I, I um, actually started out studying uh, visual art. And, um, and I remember that I was studying visual art. First, I went to a community college. Shout out to community colleges. Then I went to the University of Southern Mississippi. And I remember that I was sitting in class and they said, you know, the market is flooded. You probably won't make a lot of money doing this. And I was like, well, I want to do theater, but my fear is that I won't make any money. I won't be able to support myself. So I may as well go do the thing I really want to do. And I walked to the theater building and that, that was like a significant moment in the journey. So, um, so I worked for a while um, at the school. And then when I graduated undergrad, I moved to Florida where I really got into spoken word. Wow. And, and I, I'd studied um, acting at USM um, and I got frustrated like you with the commonly held perceptions, narrow perceptions of how a black woman could exist on stage. It was incredibly frustrating. It was dehumanizing to take in 
these scenes that I was expected to be a part of. It, I just felt bound. So I, I wrote my first um, real play that was performed uh, at USM and um, it was so liberating. And I knew that this was the path I wanted to follow. I wanted to make these stories. I wanted to occupy that space myself. And so spoken word allowed me to, to, to be the writer, performer. Spoken word was wonderful because you didn't need any other collaborators. You just needed like an open mic. And so I was hardcore spoken word for a while, which definitely shows up in my work today. And then I went to grad school at CalArts and, um, and I learned some tremendous things, met some amazing people, though it was really challenging to be there. And, um, and here I am, just kind of a weirdo theater artist today. And some of those things are, oh, oh I forgot that the music, we both do oh, yeah. music. So I, while I was exploring spoken word, uh, I also started making music. I actually released CDs from my trunk. I was serious. I had a cardboard recording oh. in my apartment that I built with sound absorbing foam. <laughs> I could barely play guitar, but I didn't let it stop me. And so I still make music, all the music for what to send up. I made, I love making music for theater and want to do a musical at some point. Um, yeah, so that's been the journey, this and that like you, and I found my way here. Um, I and I'm really grateful. Your, I love your experience with poetry because that is so, I remember when I first read What to Send Up, well, really, Is God Is. Tavi McGar, another director of color who I love so much, you know, sent me that script. And just the sheer achievement and innovation and language that you achieved on both plays, What to Send Up When It Goes Down, and that is just so thrilling. And it's like, I don't have that poetic background. So when I'm working with you, it feels, it just, it's like a yin and a yang in a really cool way. And it's amazing to hear that you have that background. Also, come on CDs, come on. <laughs> oh my God, you never told me that? That's so funny. Oh. Girl, they are out here. Those CDs are floating around. Um, so let's talk about, you mentioned what to send up. Maybe it's useful for folks to hear, especially in the space that we're in now, but always, cause right, cause what to send up has existed for years now. Let's shout out the Movement Theater Company for bringing us together on that production. And then maybe I'll talk a little about my journey with it. And then where you join the journey, you can step that in. Great. That would be so, great. So What to Send Up was born. Um, the idea for it was born when Trayvon Martin was killed. Um, I was alone in grad school. And I knew that I wanted to do something. I didn't know what it was going to be. But I knew that I had to respond using my art form to this death. And I also, it's funny, that time was a lot like this time now. I was alone, isolated in the summer, and the only access I had to other people was via my computer. So I, I wrote this piece, and when I mentioned that anger is useful, the reason that it's been really useful to my journey, and the reason I refuse to let anyone make me uh, uh, abandon my anger, is that anger for me, um, has allowed me to hop, skip, and jump over my fear and do things I wouldn't ordinarily have done. So with what to send up, I remember like making a promise aloud to myself. You're gonna follow this work, you're gonna do this work, you're gonna make it happen. And usually I would, up to that point, I kind of would make a play and get tired of it, but I was like, look, we're doing this and we're gonna follow this for however long it takes. So I was self-producing that early version of it uh, rehearsing in a living room, you know, wherever we could find a spot. Directing, though I am not a director, but I was like, I don't want to have to try and explain this to anyone. So we took it some places, um, mostly in, in California. I learned a lot and grew it each time, but it was really tremendous when the Movement Theatre Company got a hold of that text and committed to doing that work. And I remember we sat down and they said, um, think blue sky. What is the, what do you absolutely want? What is your ideal for this piece? It was so generous and it really helped it to become what it was. I was able to deepen the writing, just sit back and be a, a writer and not have to be raising funds. And um, it really birthed something new along with my collaboration with you. What was your experience of encountering that piece? Well, when I read the play, I remember, and it only happens, it's a really rare thing, but I don't know if anybody listening out there understands this, or Alicia, if you feel the same way. Every now and then you'll read a, a text for a theatrical performance, a script, a play. And when you read it, it all of a sudden, after a couple pages, or sometimes after just a couple words, it goes from an experience in the mind to an experience in the body. Even when you're reading it, you start to have a physiological response 
Maybe you get warmer. Maybe your mouth gets dry because you're anxious because you're having an emotional response. Maybe you have to stand up when you're reading it, you know? And I started having these physiological responses. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew then that it was something that I wanted to be a part of. Because if my body can get engaged in the work that quickly, I know I can direct it. And when I can't, I can't. And I remember reading the piece and after studying music for so long, you know, it read like a score. It read like the most complex, beautiful Beethoven or whatever composer that is supposed to be the pinnacle of like musical composition in the mm -hmm. Western world, which is always a white composer. But it read like that kind of a thing with ins and outs and tempos and rhythms and movements and units. And it was just the most complex black freeing thing and very similar to your response to Trevon Martin being killed I had it was like my last acting gig I ever did was at Chautauqua Theater Company and I took an eight-hour Amtrak up there and like on the course of that Amtrak the news of Sandra Bland hit and that was a that was a turning point for me her death and something that I I struggled with since, and I had no outlet for it. There was no outlet in my work for it. There was no space in the theatrical world to express that. And when I read that script, all of a sudden I was like on that Amtrak train again. Mm -hmm. And the script was, it healed something in me from that summer that had never been healed before. Mm -hmm. Like I had a wound when that woman was killed, when she, Ha when that happened to her that never healed and what to send out when it goes down upon one read just my shoulders dropped a little bit lower mm -hmm. and I was like well I have to be a part of this because it's not only calling attention to something but it's doing something that most plays cannot do it's actually giving you a real tool to deal with trauma and that is almost unheard of it's not a just sit here and watch the story and eat your snacks and then you know lights up lights down it's a come be in the room and heal a little bit. And if you don't want to be a part of that, please leave. And it, it was just the most radical thing I'd ever read, you know? I'm so honored by that, Whitney, and glad that the work resonated in that way. And that it moved from, like the writing of it was my healing and yeah. the, the, the sort of crazed, I'm gonna direct it, I'm gonna raise the money, was my healing. There was something about it that made me feel useful. Mm -hmm. and, and again, with the anger, I sort of said to myself, you know, there's a lot of fear around creation. There's fear when you're, you've never directed. How am I going to do this? How am I going to raise the money? I said to myself, this is your offering. When you go to church and you give an offering, you give the best you can. So with what to send up, I remember sort of saying to myself, give the best offering you can. And I'm glad that that offering meant something to you years later. But you said something that I think, like, if you don't mind, I want to poke at because I think sure especially for the black artists right now who are mm -hmm. looking for ways to cope and looking for ways to work. Mm -hmm. then you said that you created this play in isolation. And I, I remember when you sat me down, when I got involved with the project, you told me about that space you were in when you created it. And I wonder if you could just talk to us about it. Cause I find it incredibly inspiring um, that even in isolation and oppression, you can make something. So just tell us about it. It's so emotional to, to think about that. Thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. But I mean, just sitting behind a computer, feeling so um, oppressed is the easy word, but also kind of bound physically, I think is the reason, one of the reasons the work endeavors to just break out. It's so physical and it's so by design, something that that activates the bodies of the performers rigorously throughout from start to finish. Those, those actors will tell you that's what it is. And I think that that had to do with feeling like there was no place to put my aggression. There was no place to put my fear. There was no way to communalize my grief, right? I was in isolation. So it was all about bringing people together and making them bear witness to the spectacle of these black folks feeling exactly how they feel about anti-blackness. No hiding it, no respectability politics. I don't play those games. Let them bring their whole selves um, and, and really feel what they feel in the face of this tremendous trauma.
mm-hmm. hopefully without being re-traumatizing, right? Hopefully, and the feedback I've gotten to my face is that the ritual works, mm-hmm. that it allows them to get something out and to be with people and feel held. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I think one of the things that we've spoken a little bit about um, that I'd love to hear your thoughts on is like the way that what to send up isn't... Um, a pl- it's the relationship to the work for those performing it right is not exactly what like I am calling for something different um yeah. and and calling for people to really put themselves through a ritual what was it like for you to kind of sink into understanding about that or, or deal with that as a director well it was exciting because it's like uh, because the structure of the play w- was so radically unique it called for a different directing process so your regular little scoot to do where you sit at the table and you talk about it and then you block scene by scene it's not going to work and i would argue that that might not really ever work or create work that reflects reality at all i don't know i'm kind of arriving at that but Mm -hmm. i was like we have to get up right away and we can't just get up and try and nail it and then rehearse the same thing every time. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, we're going to have to get up and try this. We'll do one, these experiments. I call them or generative work is the term that um, I like to use. And we're going to have to generate movement that activates the text. And sometimes that movement's going to be very strenuous or dance or not realism like realism was useless to me Mm -hmm. because (laughs) the reality that we are the reality that we are forced to live in as black people here is so surreal and so hyper real every day you know i think many would argue that this period we're in it's like everyone now feels like what it's like to be us the stress and anxiety and lack of resources mm-hmm. and realizing that your country is not going to save you now everybody knows like the cat is out of the bag y'all welcome to the table okay and so when we were doing what to send up i was like well reality doesn't exist so realism doesn't exist so those little realistic acting techniques that all of us spend years freaking learning it, it's not gonna work we're gonna have to do gesture and shape and dance and we're gonna have to really choreograph this in a way that makes the language feel viscerally alive and it was we had some dope days in those rehearsal rooms there were many things that failed you know and then there were many things that soared um and so just the the way it became almost a dance piece and just this hyper physical piece was just, it was thrilling. It was like drinking adrenaline every day. It's like, you can shout here. You can do a physical gesture here. You can do a step line. You can fucking, oops, sorry. You can twerk. I'm not supposed to swear. I'm not supposed to swear. You can twerk. You know, maybe twerking is the best way to activate the line. And really what we built and what Alicia helped me learn, because it is kind of like going to the school of Alicia Harris. Like when you direct an Alicia Harris play, you kind of got to like go to like Alicia Harris college for a little bit. And, um, and like what we realized was that our vocabulary to stage the play and find the scenes was everything that exists in black culture. So you throw realism away and you look at black culture, dance, music, poetry, gesture, West African um, traditions, the griot. And then all of that kind of became our ingredients in our gumbo pot. And it was like, this scene makes me feel resilient. Well, twerk. Twerking makes me feel resilient. I'm saying twerking a lot. It's because I really miss it. I think I'm like, oh, I right. feel resilient. resilient. And I'm so grateful for you naming that. Come well, on. But Alicia, I mean, similarly, I'm talking a lot, but it's really important, I feel, to keep saying that. This is a play that existed before we came to it, and the movement elevated it in this incredible way. But I think it's really unique for other people out there who are multi-hyphenates to maybe hear about that transition for you more of going from of changing how you're interacting with the piece. And then of course, aesthetics and all of that. I mean, people should just hear you talk about your performative aesthetics because they're radically, they're just radical, you know? And I just want to jump in to give y'all the friendliest of 15s, don't worry. Um, 15 minutes before we open up to Q&A, if you still want to do that, I'm already so <laughs> your words. So to the audience at home, hey, we can- Water, you want to ask these beautiful, beautiful artists and women, Black women in this moment. And I urge you again 
to be careful about what labor you're doing when you ask these questions, what labor you are putting onto these two. Oh, don't worry. We'll tell them, we'll tell them no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted, somebody was shouting out Interfest and I want to echo that because um, Interfest is how the Movement Theater Company um, encountered what to send up and mm. brought us together. So shouts to Interfest and Chris Myers and the others who were involved in that effort. Um, so you were asking about my performative aesthetics? Yeah, like, you know, talk to us about, talk, talk to the people, talk to me about these aesthetics. It's like, because if you haven't encountered the piece, the piece has literally so many types of performance styles. It has song, it has movement, it has scenes, it has facilitation. And um, I'd love for you to talk about sure. what you think is just good theater, like why that stuff is in there at all. You know what I Great. mean? Sure, thank you, dear. So we'll start with the, um, the beginning of the piece, for those who don't know it, is uh, uh, an interactive moment um, where we call the audience together and they're given a series of prompts. And the prompts sort of escalate, but they basically um, ask folks, if you are, have heard someone say something anti-Black, take a step forward. So we're calling on the audience to participate and tell us, without saying anything, just a, a, a simple movement, um, that we've all heard people say something anti-Black and to feel in that space what that means, that the person next to you has been afraid to go to the doctor, that the person next to you has had a gun pulled on them. I've had friends express surprise because I have had police pull guns on me. So for that prompt, I step forward. Um, and so there's no, it immediately, um, designates the space a no gaslighting space because people love to gaslight black folks and tell us that the things that we're seeing aren't really there. We're making a mountain out of a molehill. So that was another part of my offering was, no, 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 we're not gonna do that. The first thing we're gonna do is, is examine this thing and say to each other, um, and it, it's, it's a little tricky the way that I do it because I don't ask anyone. You just step forward, keep it super simple and say to each other, this is a real problem that actually happens. Mm -hmm. And if it's happened to you and you feel like self-identifying, you do that. So that feels like a, a, a really impactful space. And I wanted it to be something that the lay person would do. Um, and, and so far it has been. So then we move into the more traditional um, space where the audience has a seat and they're bearing witness to um, this parody. Um, and it's a parody of the kind of play that, that many of us have seen that makes use of black bodies as a kind of furniture, a, a something that white folks step onto in order to come into consciousness. Um, that is my least favorite kind of narrative, my least favorite kind of theater. And I find it especially insidious when that sort of theater masquerades as social justice theater. Um, so I'm very frustrated with it. And I, that piece has stayed pretty much intact since the beginning of the work. And it's a play within a play called Fixing Miss. And it's basically this maid um, played by a black man, a white woman being played by a black man who insists on her goodness and, and the, the black folks who work for her just trying to maintain as they move through the repetition of their life with her. Um, and that performance style we employed, and, and some of this was your, some of this is in the text, but you are such a master at looking at text and, and infusing it with a kind of theatricality that lifts it, which is what makes you such a tremendous, one of the main things that makes you such a tremendous collaborator as far as I, I'm concerned, is that it, it moved into a kind of minstrelsy space, mm -hmm. right? And we could see these black folks trapped in this, this, this design, this thing that was designed by a white gaze and trying to escape it. And we could see the toll of performing this again and again. The play repeats itself. Definitely learned my lessons from Susan Laurie Park's Rep and Rev, Repetition and Revision, and you should read her essays if you haven't. But so the play just repeats itself. It's sort of a spiral. Um, and so that performance style is quite an abrupt shift from the beginning where it's just the people in a room answering, responding to prompts. And then we have a great number of these poetic riffs. And um, there's one figure who's talking, she's just laying out all of these experiences and they're all mine, by the way. <laughs> as just one woman's experiences, mostly in academia with anti-blackness. And as she does so, she lays out, um, she drops yarn or paper, paper, um, yeah, paper. Um, and it's switched so many times in, in my life of the show. Um, and for that performance, so I don't know, what would you call it? It's like poetic 
uh, it, it's uh, surrealism for sure. It lives between worlds in a kind of liminal space as the entire play does. And there's a lot of play on absurdity in theater, especially with the accumulation of the paper, which is like the accumulation of these assaults upon these black folks. Yeah. Say. I think, you know, I know we're supposed to go to these questions, but there's something else, you know, I'd love to hear you talk about is because your work, what to send up when it goes down is such a seminal piece and it is social justice. It is communal in this beautiful way, but your work from Is God Is to This and then the next play we're collaborating on is, it, it encompasses so much about communities and black life. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of black artists were feeling the heat right now to make social, social justice work, to make work that's mm -hmm. really specific. And it's like, I want to keep encouraging Black artists to bring their full selves to the world mm -hmm. and, you know, choose when you want to protest the way you want and make the work you want. And I think it's really inspiring that alongside with What to Send Up When It Goes Down, you've written this incredible play on Sugarland, and And just talk about how you balance, you know, world building and just making the work you want to make. You know? Sure. So I, I, I'll actually talk a little bit about Is God Is because I feel what you're saying. We marginalized people cannot allow ourselves to be pigeonholed. We can't allow ourselves to be, to feel forced to write just about our oppression and to always be sort of these symbols of the downtrodden black masses in our case. Um, and so Is God Is does not mention race a single time. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a play about Black people having their, of course, Black experience, but it's not about the Black experience as much as some people want to believe that it is. So I want to encourage creators who are listening, make your work. All yeah. of your work is the work. All of your work is disruption. Unfortunately, we've been so oppressed that anything you do, any time that your name is spoken, your name is called, and, and there's a beautiful narrative that you've created, it disrupts the mythology that this country holds about Black people. So do not be afraid. Get free and write the things you want to write. 1000%. That is so exactly it. Like you said the phrase, disrupt mythologies. And yes. I think while we come together on these pieces, you know, you're working on these new brilliant plays and I also like classics in this weird way. I'm mm -hmm. obsessed with them because every time I do a fucking classic, I get to remind people I'm here and we're here because the mythology, the highly disturbing and difficult thing about our industry, which is the American theater, is that it is based and predicated off of white Western theatrical forms. Come on. The insistence of kind of codifying these forms and teaching them in schools means that we're not there. We yes. don't exist. We're mm -hmm. not valuable. There were no black people. Shakespeare didn't know any black people. They didn't exist. There were no black people ever in antiquity. Antiquity, And that's actually a lie. And so I feel hyper, hyper engaged with Shakespeare because I'm like, actually, I'm all up in here everywhere and everything he's talking about pertains to me. And I claim it. I'm going to claim it, you know? I I love, I just want to interject really quickly. I love to think that for, for myself, I will often say to myself, everything belongs to you, Alicia. So like with Is God Is, which uses Westerns, which uses ancient Greek theater <clears throat> tropes, I'm like, I will go into the shop because everything is denied to me and I will take everything and put it into my purse. It's yeah. all mine, mine, mine. And I encourage all folks, Black folks, take everything, right? Um, there's something that feels really... Um, necessary about that and also uh it feels like a pushback it's like yeah. western culture has been shoved down our throats we've been taught unfortunately though i tried to disrupt it as an educator that the greeks started theater that every theater started but then western theater did but every every culture has its theatrical beginnings and people need to acknowledge you know what i'm saying like can you imagine how much richer our field would be if we taught everyone started theater yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's like, that's why I'm always like, make new work, make your own stories, and also get up in those classics. If I'm you want like, to. <laughs> if you want to, like, I love when people come at me about Shakespeare. I'm like, oh, really? Did you know him? Were you there in 15, 15, <laughs> whatever? Oh, you were there opening night? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't make him with a black woman. All right. All right. You know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we are here to, to shatter all of that and to encourage anyone <laughs> listening and thinking about it 
take it. It's, it belongs to you, right? They can't have our mind. I mean, they have so much. They have this control over our bodies. Do you know what I'm saying? We yeah. can't walk in certain neighborhoods. I'll be damned if I'm not going to write the thing I want to write. Yeah. 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 Um, I feel like we might be running short. How are we doing? Let's, let's talk to the people. I'm yeah, let's see questions. It might be, yeah, yeah, let's do yeah, that. But you still got some time, and I do also want to offer, like, if y'all want to keep going, look, the people are ready. The people will hear. Like, please, everybody, give Alicia and Whitney some love in these comments, on your live streams, on YouTube, in this webinar, because this, I was on mute, but I was squawking. <laughs> <laughs> camera, let me tell you. Mm, we you love you. To answer some questions. I'm happy to feed you yeah, some. Let's take some questions. Are you down for that, Whitney? Yeah, let's listen back. We'll, we'll start talking, I'm sure. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hide my video. So, the focus is on y'all. But um, here's the first question a simple one, I think. Who from previous artists have, in, have most influenced your development? Um, I have to say his name again. I have to, uh, his name is Brian Murtis. He's a director at Brown Trinity Rep. And the first play of his he that I saw was uh, Crime and Punishment. Um, and what he did to the play, my understanding of it is he injected every moment of that play with sensory rich experience. What I mean by that is like, everything you saw or heard on stage was made to trigger you either like someone made bacon during a speech about murder, you know, like black ink was all over, like everything triggered a sense. Like, so you could taste things in your mouth and you could feel things. And it was again, very triggering and in, in a really um, existential way. And that definitely uh, that style of work of triggering because I'm triggered every day and I just have to as a black woman live with that right I can't shut down I can't stop working I just have to deal with triggers all the time mm -hmm. and so the idea of directing in a way that is meant to trigger the audience that's not meant to make them comfortable and I'm not saying uh, work that can't be funny because comedy is triggering triggers can be many things um, that that has had a profound impact on my style of directing it's just inject it with as much as you can so that the human body is going to have a response i will force a response out of you yeah that's tremendous thank you for sharing mm -hmm. um i'm gonna name two names the first is um, Dr. Toni Morrison, who I did not have the pleasure of knowing in person, but I have encountered her work as, as a child, a little too young to be reading The Bluest Eye. Is there such a thing as being too young? But anyway, um, when I encounter Dr. Morrison's work, she to me is the pinnacle. She is my, I will never be that good, but I wanna be excellent. I wanna at least be reaching for that level of engagement, that level of love for black folks and insistence upon our right to be here and beauty and all things. She was a master. And then I also want to name my mentor at CalArts. His name is Douglas Kearney. He's a poet and librettist. He's amazing. You guys should Google him. You will see his visual poetry greatly influenced my work and my, um, my interest in the performance of language on the page. And also he just encouraged me to jump, move beyond my tropes, my well-worn tropes. You know, you get good at a thing and it's cute and you just keep doing it. Doug was like, no, you have to like evolve. Yeah. And among so many other lessons that I learned from him. So shouts and love to Doug. I'll, I'll hopefully, I don't think he's watching, but I'll send him love later. And then one other artist Alicia mentioned, I have to mention is Susan Laurie Parks because In the oh, Blood wow. was my first play I was in at graduate school. Mm -hmm. And in the blood, y'all, it get down with it, get to know it. It's it's quite the text. So that text had a huge impact of my understanding of like presenting blackness on stage. Cause I had never seen that portrait of blackness. It was just it had no filter, it had no like white people veneer, it was just real aggressive mm -hmm. and direct. And I was like, Oh, I can be direct? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let yeah. me try. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, Susan Laurie Parks, fucking A was my play. I would teach that to my students, my jam all day. And also her essays, um, an equation for black people on stage still resonates and speaks to some of the things we've spoken about in this conversation about the sort of narrow way of viewing black bodies and trapping black bodies on stage. And then um, her um, elements of style. Yep. More yeah. questions, y'all, come on, bring it. Uh, we got so many more, don't worry. Um, thank y'all for that answer. Uh, the next one comes from our YouTube stream. What was the most moving or transformative part of the creative process on what to send up? Was there a moment of extreme clarity or purpose in that piece's creation? Was that the piece itself? Hmm. I remember we had a day, Alicia. We mm -hmm. had a day in rehearsal. It was our last big full run and we all got to the benediction at the end and we all stopped and we kind of all broke down in tears. Yeah. And there was a moment, and this is when I have to shout out the incredible cast of actors I worked with on that production. So good. They brought so much of their humanity to it. Yeah. But there was a moment, because look, 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 look. Most of us, the way we're trained to do theater is a very phony, superficial way. Like acting training can be so superficial and we're learned to do these tricks and shit and we're not actually engaging in a way that costs us anything. And that's why half the theater that you see, especially proscenium based theater, is you don't feel anything because it doesn't cost anything. And there was a day where it all got real and we all realized what we were doing. Like we knew it, we felt it, we felt the words, Alicia's language forces a response out of you. We felt the reality as black people that these people had been killed. But there was a day when we all were just like, are we gonna be able to do this? Because we realize that there's no, you cannot bullshit your way through Alicia's theater. Mm -mm. So it was a day in the room and we just kind of had to all circle up. And I was, I was afraid. I was afraid because the, the majority of my life as a theater professional never allowed me to bring my fullest self or really speak my truth. And for the first time in my professional career, I had to speak my truth for that whole 90 minutes to two hours of that play. And I was, I was terrified. For 10 plus 15 years, I have been trained, don't speak your truth, do these little roles, do this, do that, do that. Keep it together, be calm, use technique, distance yourself. And the work just made you walk in. And so that was, I, I, I will carry that memory to the grave. That, that day I realized that theater should cost you something and you should bring all of yourself to it. Listen, I say that all the time. Thank you for sharing that. I'm honored by that. Um, but I say that, um, you know, without people getting traumatized by the work that they're doing, it should cost you something. There should be some part of you that feels like I shouldn't be doing this. You know what I mean? It should feel a little, oh, just a little. I don't want that easy theater that somebody's making that's just like shoulder shrug theater. You know what I mean? We've all seen it. Just like, I just, I did this because I could and not because I had to, right? Um, so for me, the moments is, uh, are, there, there's so many, but after what to send up, when sometimes when folks discover that I'm the one who wrote it and I'm there and there are black people left in the room, they start to tell their stories. Mm -hmm. And I can just, you can just feel, I remember a gentleman sort of rambling about the time the police stopped him when he was on his way home. You can just feel that something has uh, mm -hmm. erupted in their core. And when people are just in tears and saying, thank you, I feel my most useful as a human being I feel like I'm so deeply seated in my purpose and like I'm so proud of past Alicia who let her anger <laughs> lead her towards the creation of this space which has opened up so many doors and allowed me to meet so many folks and according to what I'm being told has been a tool that's, that's useful, not just pretty, you know, not, not cute, but like useful, ugly and useful, you know, so. Thank you both for that. Wow. I am screaming at Shoulder Shrug Theater. The people... Shoulder Shrug Theater, y'all. <laughs> I, I felt that sh theater should cost you something. Also, like wise words, truly. And I think you touched this a little bit in your conversation. You mentioned some classics. You mentioned the Greeks. You mentioned, you know, the things. Um, we got a question on Zoom. How should we be producing the classics in a way that opens them up to our communities, but does not uphold white supremacy? I have a thought about that. 
because I set out to adapt Philoctetes, and this is the new play Whitney and I are working on, um, and created my own play. But I, at first, I started out trying to adapt it, which is what a lot of um, companies will do. They'll, I have been, I have been hired to do the black adaptation of a classic. It's a problem. Um, and but what I found was having, I needed to change the assignment, and it moved from trying to adapt that work to figuring out what play I wanted to write, having read that work. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I wonder if it's about, if that's, the, the, you need to shift the assignment, right? Who says the classic has to be that? Maybe it is, and I'm not saying we shouldn't engage with classics, but I think this kind of rigorous, sometimes when I as a writer am approached to like adapt a thing, it feels like a kind of mental colonization. It's like, they feel like the, the pinnacle again, is it's, it's always a, a white work that they want me to uphold again. Um, so I wonder if that's useful. What do you think, Whitney? I love that because the thing is, I mean, this is, I, I always get a little hesitant sharing this, but this is how I feel is like, so when you work on Three Sisters, by saying the name, you're upholding a history that has not included you. And that's not that writer's fault, because if you look at Anton Chekhov, actually, he was writing about a very specific ethnic group. You know what I mean? But whatever, whatever, call me, we'll talk about that later. But, you know, in even saying this is based on this, you are affirming something that yeah. other people don't want you to be a part of. It makes them uncomfortable. They want us to do our little these plays and they get those, right? But I really like what Alicia said, which is change the assignment. Maybe your task is to make a, a specific reimagining of a Chekhov, but maybe there's just one line in Three Sisters and your piece comes from that one line. It's like plays are not God and they're not the Bible. They are just objects. And for literature and text that's written by artists who are no longer with us, they're just objects. And when you're working on them, you are a co-author of that work with that writer. And I think once you let yourself go there, the world is your oyster and your community is a part of the work. So yeah, I really agree with Alicia. I think sometimes I do get obsessed with like doing the whole thing my way. I'm so, I'm like an Aries and I'm so like, I'll get like, I have to do every word of this play and shake every word because I want white audiences to hear every word and see us doing it. Because sometimes I'm like, you need to, you need to be re-educated. You need to see this done a different way. But I really, if that feels oppressive, I think what Alicia said is really dope. Like find your, your version of it. And that's your response. And yeah, and I think it's a mental, thank you for that. I think it's a mental exercise. The way that we monumentalize and pedestalize classics is a problem, right? Yeah. It's a byproduct of white supremacy. So if we're in this moment and we're talking about that, we need to have the uncomfortable conversation about what it means to say to a community of color, which I mentioned again, because I've seen it so many times, mm -hmm. we're going to get you guys together and we're going to do a Shakespeare play. Like why, you know, and, and I'm not, and I don't mean to suggest that we shouldn't do Shakespeare. Right. But I think it, we shouldn't take for granted that Shakespeare is, is, the pinnacle and is the best thing for that community, right? And I think that's what it is. It gets tricky because people are like, we're offering you people who are low something that's high and you get to rise to this high thing with us. Look at this favor we're doing you. And you can just feel the like racism, you know? It's like, um, and when you feel stuck, y'all, you need to go learn about African theater. You need to learn about Indonesian theater, Chinese theater. They have been doing it. You know, we're on the year 2000, boo, they're like on 5,000. They think <laughs> they didn't have theater before the Greek. It's like madness. So it's like, yeah. start. Yeah, I really do have to shout out like Polynesian theater too, because it's, it it's like everything in a bag of chips and it will rock your world. So it's like, if you feel that doing a Western classic is oppressive, there's other classics and there's other ways. Go look at what other people on the earth have been doing, you know? <laughs> Sam, how are we doing on time, dear? Yeah. We are doing so good. We technically have three minutes left, but we can totally take some time, go over. It's entirely up to you. We take two more, one more, two more. Oh, yeah, let's, let's do two more. Let's okay. do two more. I do want to say shout out J. Nicole Brooks, that twerking reaction. Yes. 
We are twerking behind our cameras, everybody. Yes! <laughs> twerking is classic work. I love a good twerk. Listen. Mm-hmm. I think this is actually, this question uh, coming from YouTube builds off a bit of what you were talking about, but maybe with contemporary work. Um, somebody shared, I had the blessing of experiencing what to send up when it goes down. And can I also aside, we don't name the whole title often enough. It is what to send up when it goes down. Right. Um, they had the blessing of seeing that show during the ART run, I believe is what they're trying to say, and also the New York run, um, and it affected them deeply. What was it like to adapt to larger spaces and, parentheses, wider audiences? I'm gonna let Whitney White start that, with that response, the <laughs> response to that question. It was interesting, y'all. We live in a very large country and I think a lot of us and probably a lot of people even in this group, what is this, a Zoom, in this thing that we're doing right now might be New York-based artists. And I think while in New York, we're so blessed to be together, commune together, be talking. We're often talking to people that feel similarly to the way that we do. And the second you go out and you start doing theater in communities where that's not the case, it becomes very, I just keep doing this thing. It's like a stress ball, like the air gets thicker. Because Mm. the reality is we are living in a very, very racist country. Even New York is. But it's like when you go out and you start getting out there, y'all, and doing work and looking those audiences in the eye and speaking your truth, it's an incredibly vulnerable thing. And again, I have to shout out to my actors who, you know, I'm a director. And then after a while, it's not all, it's it's my cast who has to get up there and be the warriors. So I think I, I personally noticed a profound difference performing with the audiences in New York, DC, and Boston. Yeah. I feel those differences. I'm still learning how to articulate that, but those differences were real. And I'll just say, um, when you are presented with a threat, the human mechanism does that or it fights back. And so I could feel that happening at times. Um, And then in in terms of adapting it for larger spaces, what Alicia told me, which is really dope, is like, we exist everywhere. Blackness exists everywhere. We can take over any space. We could take over a Broadway space. We could take over the corner down there. We could take over your mall, you know? And so it was very liberating to think that this play belongs everywhere. It's not the kind of play that only has to be in this theater and like the risers have to be that way or else, oh no, no theater. And you know, with COVID, we might need to be making more theater like that, that can go everywhere and be everywhere. Um, and that, that's a kind of very noble quality of the play. I think it's very unpretentious in that way, right? It's not, oh no, sorry, our play only exists in a big Broadway house. Guess you can't come if you ain't got that $150. No, it can go everywhere. Right, right. I think I'll just let your um, response stand so we have more time for the next question. No, everything you said- Next question is just Alicia. Yes, you can. Everything you said was perfect. Thank you. But if you have a response, we have an abundance of time, okay? Our relationship to time is scarce, but (laughs) somebody um, in a session yesterday said, time is our relative. Um, Mm -hmm. So let Mm -hmm. us treat them as such. And if, if you have a response, please feel free. Otherwise, I do have another question. Uh, essentially adapting to the space, I didn't think was a, it was tricky, right? Um, moving, you know, different floors could be a challenge where the dressing rooms were, how to make that exit. But the piece was created to uh, work with minimal props uh, very intentionally because I, when I started out, I was by myself, right? And so was was making, trying to create a work that could go many places and where the greatest spectacle in the work was these bodies in motion. So as long as we had these actors, we were good to go. So um, it, it shifted. I didn't get to see it in Wooly in the big house of Wooly Mammoth, but from what I saw, the work still resonated beautifully. It was fantastic at Howard and their teeny tiny black box. Um, it was wonderful. Um, in other spaces, it was it it, it worked. I felt um, in terms of the audience reactions, they were different. I think New York felt a little, I don't know, like front footed or how to describe them, just a little more here and ready for it. Ready. And I think ready. I, ready. And I think that the responses that I experienced in DC um, 
were uh, a little more uh, reserved or hesitant. Now, I wasn't there for all of it, so I can't speak to the entirety of the tour, but I definitely felt like there was a little bit of this, except from the young people. You weren't there for this, Whitney, but we had some youth that came in um, at the, um, the uh, Duke Ellington High School for the Performing Arts mm -hmm. that were a treasure. These two um, young Black uh, teenage girls were just a bucket of tears and they were with it and they loved the cast. It was, it was remarkable. So all in all, fantastic and grateful for it and, and learned a lot along the way. Thank you both. Um, we'll take this last question from Zoom and then we'll close out with Adrian here in a second. Um, can you share with us a bit about your What to Send Up online efforts in this moment? Um, and if I can add, just like what, what are you, what are you hoping to get out of moving this online? Whitney, do you want to talk about the love letters no, effort? Sure. Okay, so we are working on uh, the Movement Theater Company is fantastic, and I know, I know they're in the house. I see them posting. Mm -hmm. um, so with the movement, Whitney and I have been working on these love letters for Black people, which is inspired by a prompt in the play when we ask the invite the audience to write love letters, write some lovely words to black people living in an anti-black society and we read a few of them get read at the end of the piece but also on the tour they were collected and placed in the space um and it's been really lovely because people could look at them at the end of the experience black people could walk through and read them so we've moved that and there's an instagram page and i believe Deidre and david are posting they're posting about it already um, in the chat here um so that's one effort the other is that on my website um, I've created a, a living memorial, which has the names of folks who have died. It is not complete. It will never be complete because we don't know all the names of people who've been killed by anti-Blackness. Um, but it is something that I'm trying to keep a handle on. So the names and faces are gathered and a little bit about these folks. There's an opportunity for you to write to me and give me a name to add to this memorial wall. You can also, uh, also love letters exist there. So there are love letters posted. Some of them uh, we took photographs of from the tour. And then some people have submitted um, in the past few weeks and I've, I've tried to get up on the site as soon as I can. Um, and those are the digital efforts, unless I'm min missing anything, Whitney, that we've got online. Short film, uh, a video. That's, I didn't know if we were talking about that, but go ahead. The video, you know, I think I'll keep it brief, but the amazing thing that Alicia is doing with her work is she's looking for solutions. It's not pain porn. We're all so used to that. We're used to that. We're used to the slave narratives. We're used to the black actor having to come out stage and wail and cry and be a object for abuse furniture as Alicia said, and Alicia's actually trying to make work that is not just opening a scab. It's trying to give you a balm for those scabs you already have. Um, and the video is something that hopefully will do that. And we look forward to sharing it with you guys. Yeah, we'll put it up on our social media when it, when it exists. Thank you. That is perfect because my next question for you before I transition over to Adrian, can you please both tell the people where to find you? How do they find these resources? What are your handles? What's going on? Um, I, I can be found on Twitter at aharris1361, on Instagram, A-L-E-S-H-E-A -E dot Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S. And uh, on, on the website for the, some of these digital resources are at bagofbeans.net. And you'll just have to click through and find the page for what to send up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you can find me, yes, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, yes, I'm Whitney White. And um, I have a little website. Look up Whitney White. There's another sister named Whitney White. She's really fierce. Um, but you'll just say Whitney White Directory and it'll come up. And um, yeah, I, I hope to just be sharing more work with all of you soon. Yeah, we're so honored to have gotten to be here with you all. Thank you for watching, for listening, um, and for being in community with us. Take care of yourselves and thank mm -hmm. you to the TCG. You're an yeah. incredible organization. Before I was making the theater I wanted to make, I would get those magazines and just dream and hope that what I wanted to talk about would be in there one day. And I'm incredibly grateful to TCG for making this space. It's very, very brave. So thank you. Thank y'all for not being performative and really yeah. doing the work. We see you, we are watching. <laughs> yeah. Alicia and Whitney, thank you so much. That was brilliant. 
so inspired. Um, and thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. Um, folks, in this fall, TCG Books will be publishing Alicia's play, His God Is. So stay tuned. We're so honored to be working with you, Alicia. Um, so thanks again. A few quick things uh, to remind folks. Uh, we want to make sure that you all saw that we added a session this afternoon at 6.30 for BIPOC at predominantly white institutions. Please check out Mighty Mighty Networks for the Zoom link. Um, also, uh, please share at least one moment from Alicia and Whitney's conversation that was meaningful to you in the chat on Zoom or comments on, on, on YouTube. Uh, we wanna make sure we hold a moment so to engage in this act of sheer gratitude and we'll definitely save these affirmations. And also, um, just wanna really thank our many supporters for making our work possible. The Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the Howard Gilman Foundation, Fisher Dax Associate and Capacity Interactive. Uh, thank you for trusting and supporting us to be responsive and to reframe our work to send center our BIPOC colleagues and theater makers. Folks, until next time, thank you so much for being with us and uh, we'll see you again. Alicia and Whitney, much love. Thank you, thank you, thank you.